Hi everyone, I'm Dr. Yosefa Fogel Rubel, and this is One on One Women Talk Torah, a series brought to you by Matan Women's Institute for Torah Study. If you would like to sponsor a podcast episode in honor or in memory of a loved one, please contact the Matan office or email us at podcast at matan.org.il. That's podcast at matan.org.il. Welcome back to Matan's one-on-one podcast. Today's episode has been dedicated by Matan student Carol Damon in memory of her father, Isidore Goldberg, Simcha Yisrael ben Shmuel, who passed away on the 16th of Tammuz, the day we read Parshat Pinchas in Israel this year. Each week we spend 30 minutes speaking about a seminal figure or idea on that week's Parsha. Parshat Pinchas opens with the reward granted to Pinchas for his act of zealotry, which will be the focus of today's episode. This is followed by another census whose purpose arouses varied commentaries. And then we have the moving story of the daughters of Tzlovchad, who revolutionized legislation surrounding female law inheritance. Yoshua is appointed as Moshe's successor, and then the Parsha closes with the details of special Shabbat and holiday additional sacrifices, or what we call Musafim. Today I am pleased to welcome a friend and a scholar, Yossi Ben Harush, who is currently a Judaic Studies teacher at an SAR high school in Riverdale and a former teacher in the Hartman High School for Boys here in Jerusalem. He is a doctoral student in the Department of Jewish Thought at Ben Gurion University and writes about Hasidut or Hasidism in the land of Israel at the beginning of the 20th century. Among other things, he studies the ultra-Orthodox world and the theological, sociological, and anthropological changes that have taken place in the recent years. He holds a master's degree and a bachelor's degree in Jewish thought from the Hebrew University. Yossi, it's great to have you here today. Thank you so much, Yosef. It's great to be here. So we're here to speak about Pinchas. Now, you don't know this, I don't think, Yossi, but in my doctoral writing, I spent a lot of time talking about uh, angry Levites. And so I spent some time with Pinchas, although he's a priest and that was its own complication. But, uh, <laughs> but we have this episode that is complicated. And it's complicated really for more modern eyes because in Tanakh itself, he seems to be very clearly rewarded. And most of the commentaries think that they go along with the verses, which don't seem to criticize Pinchas. Uh, There are those who try and look out the Brit Shalom that he's given, uh, this covenant of peace that maybe it's because he needs to be taught to be more peaceful. But already a lot of those are much later commentaries. The Psukim seem to really laud Pinchas for what he does. There are those who even say, I'm thinking of the Bukhor Shores commentary in this Pasuk, uh, one of the Balei Atosafot, Rav Yosef Merolians, uh, where he basically says, Pinchas did Am Yisrael a huge favor. He saved them from collective punishment. It's a good thing that he killed them. Uh, he had to kill an Israelite. He had to kill the, the prince from Shimon, but it's a good thing that he did it because he saved everybody else from collective punishment. And so in Tanakh and, and most of the early Rishonim, our, our earlier commentators, things seem pretty good in our judgment of Pinchas. Now, it's not totally true what I said, because you have some Midrashim that already start picking up criticism and say, well, Pinchas did good. We have to be very, very careful about how we carry that into our own lives, how we allow that to be assimilated into our own behavior. Um, But certainly as modern readers, we come across a text like this or other violent texts, and we have more to deal with on a moral level. And so I'm just sort of throwing that out there uh, because there is a lot to support what Pinchas does. And, but we certainly see cropping up throughout the generations already in a number of places in Chazal, this hesitation about Pinchas's behavior that, well, maybe it was good for everyone to be really careful to not make it seem like the Torah sanctions this kind of behavior. And you today are coming to bring us another side of, of these events, sort of more Hasidic interpretations, which as I said to you in our small talk before we started recording, that I am with you and I'm your student because this is not my personal <laughs> field of expertise. But I'm, I'm really curious and excited to hear what, you, what you're going to bring to us today. Yes, so I think it connects really to what you, you said about the um, carefulness that we use right, about the implementation of this idea of Pinchas into our own life, and actually the idea of zealotry in general. 
because looking at it from a Hasidic perspective, now it's very difficult to talk about a Hasidic perspective. So it's I'm kind of like saying a Jewish perspective. Na- There's sort of like yeah, 50, like a Jewish perspective. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> so I'm I'm going to say something very specific. I'm going to say that in the beginning of the 20th century, when the concept of being kind versus being zealous became to play an important role mm. in every Jewish person's life, because you need to pick sides at that point. You would you would either be on the side that is very zealous and very and very canai and to to guard whatever you thought it should be guarded, or you would say no. Wait a second, pinchas is is is, some, is actually something as you said. We should be very careful about how to implement pinchas into our lives. When we read it every week in the parasha, what is this? What is this pinchas? Right. So it becomes more critical for Hasidic interpreters in the beginning of the 20th century because they have a conflicting idea. A, they want us to live the parasha. They want us to read the parasha and say, oh, every pasuk has a direct implication to my everyday life. Every character, every figure, every story has a great idea about how I should change the way I live tomorrow. Mm -hmm. And on the second side of it, yeah, you get all these violent stories. You get all these things that looks very weird to the beholder in the beginning of the 20th century. And why and this why is, is that change happening in the beginning of the 20th century? This idea of being kind, Jews weren't didn't want to be kind before that. <laughs> no, they they did want to be <laughs> kind, but f- suddenly uh, 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 being zealous became a virtue because in the beginning of the 20th century, when it's anachronistic to say liberal, but more human rights or human mm. privileges focused authorities and governments and ideas play a more significant role suddenly people say wait a second but how does it affect the ideals and beliefs that i want to keep Mm -hmm. and suddenly zealotry becomes something that we might think as a virtue as something we want we want to keep we want to uphold and the idea of the formation of author orthodoxy and later on the formation of um mamash haredi communities that are closed to outside worlds as an ideology is very critical so people wanted to be kind but they also wanted to be the keepers of what they believed so here comes a very interesting um juxtaposition of those two ideas right how to be a kind and be part of the uh, citizens of europe and and the other side is to become zealous and i think that a lot of rabbis and a lot of thinkers knew that when Parashat Pinchas comes, their statement about the parasha would be critical to the understanding of this, this juxtaposition between two ideas to their Hasidim. Mm. So a lot of rabbis, right, my Mori Rabbi, Professor Benjamin Brown once said, and during a lecture, that if you want to actually know about how a person thinks with the regard of this interesting conflict between being a zealous and being a, a, a kind or a liberal person, you should read his drasha and parashat pinchas, right? This is like the mission statement of what I think should be the values of, 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 of a Jew in the beginning of the 20th century. And he did a very interesting uh, lecture about uh, actually the, the Hasidut from my, uh, from my master's degree, Shomre Munim, Toldot Aaron, who became famously known as Kanaim. But I want to read, read something else. Um, okay, so take, us, wanna, take wanna, us into the Shem Ishmuel. Which is, by the way, the book that people read around me in Midrashot that I never picked up myself. So I'm very excited to have that, that entryway today. Um, it's it's, yeah, st- so it's the, still very popular. It's still very popular. It's still, I think, I, think uh, I recently saw um, 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 a shiul given in YU about the Shemish it's very, it's very, It's very popular. It's very, it's very interesting because it has a combination of, of, of many things, right? It's the Rosh Yeshiva who is a, a, a descendant of the Kotsk dynasty, who is the son of the Egleital and the Avne Nezer, you know, the famous uh, Poisek, who writes Hasidic commentaries, and then later on, his whole family gets caught up in Zionism and, and moves to Israel in a way. So it's a, it's a very interesting, and he also lives in a very interesting period of time, right? Exactly when the centuries turn, right? It's a very interesting time to, 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 to live and to write. So Harav Shmuel Bernstein, we should uh, say his name, his book is Shem uh, Shmuel, as, as other uh, Hasidic rabbis are known after their books. Um, and he has a very interesting take. Uh, but to get to his take, I want to do a detour. And this detour is to go to Amos Oz. Mm. And Amos Oz 
published a few years ago a book called uh, Shalom Lakanaim. It was translated in English, Dear Zealot. And I think it's a very interesting way to, to understand the Shem Yishmuel through Amos Oz. So it's three, it's a, it's a nonfiction, right? It's three letters that he writes to, to different um, people in the population, right? So the first one is called, after the book, Dear Zealot. It, I think it connects to, to what you said about, um, about the dangers, right? The carefulness. He says, fanatics tend to live in a black and white world with a simplistic view of good against evil. The fanatic is in fact a person who can only count to one. Yet at the same time and without any contradiction, the fanatic almost always basks in some sort of bittersweet sentimentalism composed of a mixture of fury and self-pity. Mm. He or she prefers to feel instead of think. Death, their own or someone else's, enthralls fanatics and excites their imagination. Not infrequently, they find this world despicable and loathsome and aspire to escape it as soon as possible, right? And this is, I think, the most bad or evil, <laughs> in air quotes, to read Pinchas, right? He is this zealous guy who comes out of nowhere and only sees the world in black and white and doesn't have any account about the, the, the fragility of the people of Israel in the Midbar, he doesn't have any any account to whatever happens after the act. He sees this terrible thing happens, right? Zimri ben Salu and Kuzvi Batsu doing an un unorthodox holy, behavior in the temple. Or unorthodox area. behavior, yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Thank you. And he decides to to act because he only sees the world in black and white. Yeah. And Namuz Oz puts it later on: someone has to die to preserve this zero sum game, mm -hmm. right? Someone has to die. And this is the most, I think, evil, or I don't know, bad, or, or maybe a perspective from a very liberal per person to look at Pinchas, to look at him as this fanatic that only wants to maim or to kill, because he wants this to end with the victory, with the ultimate victory of what he thinks is good. As you're reading that, I'm thinking mm -hmm. that whether people are fanatic about their conservatism or fanatic about their liberalism, everybody has... If, they, if they're passionate humans, they have moments of zealotry. And what happens when we turn people into stick figures, or let's say take Pinchas as the, you know, the flagship of zealotry, is that many of us have moments of Pinchas throughout our life, but they are on different sides of the, of the lines. And, and ultimately, we also have moments where we're fanatic and moments where we are, where we are not, where we see things in a much more a nuanced kind of way. So meaning this moment of Pinchas' life, it's funny because he comes up in a number of other places in Tanakh, uh, and they're not nearly as volatile as this one. And so he gets known for this moment of this big decision of his. But I would argue that from the little we know of him from the rest of Tanakh, his life is, you know, is, is, has many shades to it. And so I, I'm just saying that we're going with this reading because this is how Pinchas has been looked at throughout the generations. But if I can yes. characterize him for a moment and think of him as, as a real person, I would say that, you know, this moment is his moment of, of kana'ut, of zealotry. But, but most of us have those moments at some point in, in our life. And it doesn't mean that that's our life perspective always. It means that was where he was at that moment and he took uh, an action that was very self-defining. But Amos Oz, as a person, also has fanaticism in him. It's just a different kind yes. of fanaticism or a different shade. Yes, yes. And, and I think it's very true to look at Amos Oz and, and in his writing to the Kanaim and say, what are you Kanai? Right? Yeah. What, what are you? What are you, you're, what are you you're, zealous you're, for? How, where's, your, where's your Pinchas moment, yeah. right? Maybe it's this actual thing you're writing is your Pinchas moment. Yeah. Um, and I, and I think a key word that you said, and I'm very connected, and I think that, that will lead us to the Shemi Shmuel, is passion, mm -hmm. right? Because zealotry is, is an act of passion. And, and it, a lot of times it's connected to what you're passionate about. What's, what's the thing that, that puts you? And also, it also adds up with the result, right? How far are you willing to take your passion? Which is amazing. And I think it's very important to look at it from that perspective. But it's also very interesting to look at the perspective of what, what was your passion? What was your, what was your motivation to have the Spinchas moment? And I think that this is what interests Hashem Mishmuel very much. And not like Amos Oz that sees Pinchas as someone who only sees himself very selfish because he, he knows what's good. 
The Shem Ishmoel in his um, Drasha from 1913, Tafresh Ein Gimel, talks about the idea of Achdut Israel, right? The unity of Israel. That's what Pinchas was so passionate about. He looked at the situation with Balak and Kozvi Batsur, right? Because the Midrash connects the idea of the Parashat Balak and Parashat Pinchas after Balak failed to a curse, right? With the help of Bil'am to help the curse of Israel, he used the, the daughters of Moab and the daughters, right? To, to, to seduce, to tempt the, 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 the people of Israel. And therefore, this is where he could find a, a way to break what he couldn't done do with the curse. And the Shem Ishmael says, Pinchas, Pinchas, the, the narrativical Pinchas that the Shem Ishmael sees in front of him, sees the breaking of the unity of Israel sees a way that Bnot Moav brings Perud, brings separation to the people of Israel. And he, when he looks at it, his idea is if this continues, there would be no excuse to preserve the people of Israel. There, was be, there would be no reason for Hashem to continue carry these people in throughout the wilderness to the land of Israel. Because what identifies the people of Israel in Pinchas's eyes is their unity. So the temptation here is not the temptation of a flesh, right? The temptation of a sexual thing. The temptation here is the temptation to break the unity, to, th to say, I am not identifying anymore as part of the, of the Israelites in the, in the wilderness. And for Pinchas, this is a live or die moment. This is a moment where there is, if you are not, if you're not going to act, you're going to lose everything. And then, he says this, Pinchas שמסר נפשו על ברית של כל ישראל, הבריח את הכוחות החיצוניים מכל הדת ישראל. Pinchas, that he gave his life, and it's interesting to, see, to understand what's, what, where is Pinchas giving his life, but he gave his life to the covenant of all the people of Israel. He himself banished all the evil forces from the congregation of Israel, right? And the idea of banishing the evil forces is much more critical. What's Pinchas Mesirut Nefesh? How, in what way Pinchas gave up his, his soul? The actual idea of, of, of murder. Mm. So in a way, Pinchas is not doing something when he doesn't act, Kosvi is dead, Zimri Ben Salu is dead, but he, uh, he comes out clean. He is doing something very, very bad for himself because his passion is for something very, very deep that he understands about the people of Israel in the wilderness. It's interesting because what I hear you saying so far is that what Pinchas sees is somebody who is acting as an individual, meaning we're in this collective existence in the wilderness, and that moment where he chooses to sacrifice himself, and we'll understand more in a moment what exactly he's sacrificing, but he chooses to sell in his own character because he wants to maintain the collective nature of the way they existed in the Midbar. And in a previous episode on Parshat Korach, we spoke about this a little bit more, uh, where we spoke about the concept of collective punishment, the dangers of collective punishment, and also the fact that Hashem in some ways decides to mitigate collective punishment early on in Sefer Bamidbar, when he says that anyone who makes any mistakes in the area of the Mikdash so will only blame the Levi'im for that. But putting that piece aside, is is that Pinchas is trying to preserve the positive side of this, meaning we act together. Mm -hmm. And so when he sees somebody acting for himself, for his own benefit, whether it's a spiritual slash sexual or some sort of combination of the two, however you understand what they were actually doing, that that is what really makes Pinchas lose it and decide that he has to behave the way he does. So it's like this tension between the collective and the individual. That's how that's how we're presenting it so far, if I understood correctly. Yes. Okay. Yes. And also, uh, I think uh, the Shem Ishmael plays a very interesting idea with the uh, separation in unity, right? Ichud mm -hmm. 
Uh, and he says, you know, the killing someone, death, is also a sort of separation between a body and a soul. And the separation that Pinchas is willing to make to kill someone, to separate a body from a soul, is to preserve the unity of the people of Israel. Wow. And also, Pinchas has, is, is also giving up, as you said, he's giving up his own personality because he becomes a killer. He becomes a murderer. And this is something that is the Mesirut Nefesh, the sacrifice that Pinchas makes. The idea that he now becomes a, a murderer. But he's willing to do this. He's willing to do this in order to keep the unity together. In the end of the Dasha, and we'll go back to the Dasha in a minute, but in the end of the Dasha, uh, the Shemishmon continues with this idea and says, this is why he was given Brit Shalom. This is why he was given um, Kehuna, priesthood, and also peace. Because peace is the ultimate unity. Mm. We, Hashem acknowledges the sacrifice of Pinchas and says, you have given up something for the unity, so I'm giving you the two fundamental aspects of unity. One is shalom, bringing peace and allowing unity to live without the terrible sacrifice of becoming a murderer. And the second is to be a Kohen, to be a priest, which is the unity between the Elyonim, the Apai, and the Tachtoni, those who dwell in this world. So and, it was, and, it was and, a reward to Pinchas, but it was really a way to bring him to tikkun, to some sort of repair for what he had broken inside of himself by doing this action. Yes, mm -hmm. yes. To acknowledge the, the passion that he had and to give him the opportunity to have it without this terrible sacrifice of becoming a murderer. And also giving him the opportunity to connect in your limb with Tachtonim, right? And therefore, again, Hashem Ishmael continues, we know that Pinchas is Eliyahu Anavi, according to the Midrash, according to the Zohar, Pinchas is Eliyahu. So therefore, be Malachi, and this is the ultimate generational unity mm. that comes in the time of the Mashiach. So now I'm putting on my Chokel Hasidut, right? The, the Hasidut scholar or Hasidut researcher hat. And I'm trying to think of what was the motivation, motivation, right? right? The motivation of the Shem Ishmuel to give this drasha in 1913 to his congregates in Shochachov. Right? What did he think? And I think that it, all the things we spoke about earlier came to play here. Right? Because the people who live in Sochachov in 1913, they have this idea that Pinchas can be read as Amos Oz reads it. As this figure that is, as you said, stick figure, right? that only, only acts in a selfish way. And they may look at people around them and see people acting in a very passionate, maybe even a zealot way. And they say, oh, these people... They don't have any good intentions. They're only trying to do it because they're selfish. They're only doing it because they wanted to preserve something they believe in and they don't look. And the Shem Ishmael says, wait a minute, we have to look at those passionate people and say, what's their motivation? When you look at someone and you say, oh, he's doing kema'aseh pinchas, he's being this zealot, right? And you say, wait a second, maybe this person wants actually to unite the congregation. It's interesting how he does that or how they do it. But more than it's interesting to see how they do it, it's interesting to see what their motivation. And if their motivation is to preserve Achdut Yisrael, the unity of Israel, we should maybe look at them a different way. And maybe maybe look at them for having Pinchas moments from a very good intention. And the intention is critical. And by saying this, it's also criticizing all those who are doing the acts of Pinchas and actively encouraging separation. Mm. And this is the most interesting part. The Shem Ishmael says, if you're coming and doing this zealot action and you're coming from a idea of unity, good, I can vouch for you. I can say good, I can, I, I can understand you. I can say you need tikkun, you need some way of doing it without sacrificing. Okay, but if you're doing it from that motivation, good. All the other people, they're doing this zealot actions and they're doing it because they want to create separation between communities between people they want to close the doors and don't let other people in they want to say i am here and you are there and i will i'm willing to sacrifice a lot to keep this gap between us those people are not worth considering as pinchas they're not entitled for the name pinchas or they're not entitled for the prize of Briti Shalom and Brit Keunat Olam. 
they are the people that we should be very suspicious of. Because if you read Pinchas as someone who wanted to preserve Achdut Yisrael and the unity of Israel, all the other people that are doing something against it are not under the same umbrella, are not under the same category. If I can ask you historically, if you can fill in just the, yeah. the image in my mind of who, who are these warring factions that, you know, in his community, if, if we know of it, that, that he's thinking of, meaning there are many polemics and, and many different mm -hmm. factions and, and internal politics that have obviously enshrouded our religion from the dawn of time. But who, who is he thinking of? Who, who's trying to pull things apart in, in the world that he's living in, the Shemi Shmuel? Oh, so it's a good question. And I can only assume, but I think the, the assumption here will be that Hashem Shmuel looks at people coming from towns or villages and putting a lot of effort to identify who's part of Am Yisrael and who is an Erev Rav, an outsider, someone who only identifies as a Jew, but not really as a Jew, because he is a Zionist, because he mm -hmm. is a, a, a socialist, because he is not that religious, because he goes to whatever, because he reads those kinds of books, because he doesn't practice so on and so on, because she doesn't do where this kind of thing or where this kind, I don't know, it's a lot of things. And I think that there's a lot of effort and I, I in my masters, I, I, I dealt with other people who are very, um, their life project was to identify who's in and who's out. And I think the Shem Shmuel looks at those people and say, you think that you can call yourselves Pinchas, right? This Hashem, Kanayla Hashem, right? Person who is left for Hashem, doing for it for a noble cause. But if you're not doing it for the unity of the people of Israel, you're not entitled of the name. And, and I think that historically is a very bold move from a Hasidic rabbi, who is also a Rosh Yeshiva, who is also a Posek. Right, so I think say, right, this idea is sort of yeah. applicable to, to polemics or internal politics at all times. But the idea being that we, you can be a zealot and you can have more fundamental positions, but they ultimately need to be aimed at bringing things together as opposed to pulling them apart. Yes. You know, I see the time are winding down and I, I wanted to just, if it's possible, to yeah, end with you. something from Rabbi Sachs's book, Not in God's Name, where he addresses the concept of religious violence. And this, this idea of Rabbi Sachs really points to what I, I opened with, this idea that we have to be very careful how we look at our texts and how we read them or perceive them at one point in history is not how we'll look at them later. How we read the Torah in the first century BCE is not how we're going to read it in the early 20th century or, or certainly not in, in, our current, in our current environment. And he says the following, he says, living traditions constantly reinterpret their canonical texts. This is what makes fundamentalism texts without interpretation, an act of violence against tradition. In fact, fundamentalists and today's atheists share the same approach to texts. They read them directly and literally, ignoring the single most important fact about a sacred text, namely that its meaning is not self-evident. It has a history and an authority of its own. Every religion must guard against a literal reading of its hard text if it is not to show that it has learned nothing from history. Now, what Rabbi Sachs says so beautifully in this quote is this idea that fundamentalism is text without interpretation, right? If we just bring in, and I love looking at the pshat, okay? But if we if we talk about just the the, fun, the plain meaning of the text and we don't look at it in its context, in the way that it's being read throughout history, then we will get ourselves into a very dangerous place. He talks about the danger of of being a kanai when it comes to your text, meaning of taking your text and taking mm. it to a fundamental place, which is, of course, what we've seen in many fundamental interpretations of religion uh, in the world we live in today. And I think that what you've illustrated so um, eloquently here today is, is A, this ability to take these texts and read them throughout different generations, which, again, I think you've for sure illuminated uh, a dimension of the text that most of us are not familiar with uh, from this particular Hasidic perspective. And I think it's a general invitation to anyone to open up whatever Hasidic commentary they want and see what see what there is there. Um, but, but particularly that, of course, like many of us religious learners of Tanakh, is that also in different Hasidic sects that they're looking at this text and trying to figure out what to take from it. Uh, and that 
Pinchas seems to have a very positive dimension to him. But as you're bringing here today, specifically from the Shem Mishmuel, and as we've sort of rejected Amos Oz uh, in a very open way, is uh, is that ultimately there is room for zealotry or even fundamentalism if ultimately the goal is to bring people together and not apart. Now, that itself is also a dangerous phrase. So we're not here. Yes, We are true. not making any political statements. We're just speaking a little bit of Torah here on the Parsha. But I think that the idea is a precious one. This idea that even when somebody is doing something that seems extreme, if they will be guided by an internal force, which is trying to bring things together in an organic way, then it may help steer them towards a place that is healthier, perhaps, and that is extreme, but within a context of the real world around them. First of all, a great Hasidic paragraph by <laughs> by Rabbi Zacks. Yes. Meaning, I, I th and think that at least for this very narrow slice of Hasidut, like early 20th century, this is something they, they were very eager about, to look at the text again and again and learn new ideas, how, again, how it changes the way I act tomorrow morning. Mm -hmm. Not in a week, right? You leave the drasha and and erev Shabbat or suda shlishit, and you motzei Shabbat, you act differently. So that's the first thing. And also, I I I think that you you touch upon a point with this. It's critical for the Shem Ishmuel. Again, I'm I'm no expert of the Shem Ishmuel, but I can say from the last year that I've I've been dealing with the Shem Ishmuel even more that the Shem Ishmuel doesn't want you to give up your passion. He doesn't want you to say. In the name of being kind, or in the name of being good, or in the name of trying to get things organically united, I will give up my passion. I will say, I'm not doing anything passionately. I'm just, you know, lukewarm. And Shem Ishmael says, no. Your struggle, your idea, your conflict should be always how I preserve my internal flame, the things that keeps me going in a very passionate way. And that thing should lead to the same result that I would have if I would, in my mind, would give up this passionate idea. Meaning it will create unity, it will create organic unity between all kinds of places, it will create wholeness, it will create peace. If you are able to do this, you achieved anything. Giving up on each side of the, of the rope here, giving up either are you passionate or giving up on the idea that you need to unite everything together is losing is doing something that is not true. You need to preserve those two elements in order to be what he calls, right, a person who is worthy of the name Pinchas. And I think it's very interesting, again, and in, in, in not saying anything about today, but just the idea for Vodat Hashem to say, we want to preserve the passionate part of our lives and we also want to this passionate thing to bring peace and to bring unity and to bring calmness and to bring a, a connection between Aelionim and the Tachtonim, I think it's very, very interesting and, and, and very applicable to our everyday life. Yossi, thank you so much for being here. Thank you so much. It was so interesting. Thank you. Wow. So for those of you who are still listening, uh, I have a particular interest in hearing how people get into their fields, what interests them, what's the life story behind the things that fascinate them. And after I finished speaking with Yossi about this week's Parsha, I decided to ask him that personal question. So for those of you who want to hear as well, or if this is also uh, a particular point of interest for you, keep listening to hear how Yossi explains how he got involved in studying Hasidut. You see, you know, no one here listening can see you, okay? But let's just say <laughs> that um, you're not a chassid. I don't think if, if that's a, you're not a chassid in your religious uh, association, meaning you obviously learn chassidut. Yes. And I will say for all those listening who aren't familiar, I would say, especially if you're listening on the outside of Israel side of, of the lines, is that chassidut is something that has been greatly revived in its study within the religious Zionist world in Israel in the past couple of decades. There's a number of interesting reasons for why that's happened, a number of interesting organizations and teachers in particular uh, who really brought that into, into being. There's a number of people at this point that we can look at historically who really brought Hasidu learning into the Tatilumi world. Um, so I'm just sort of curious if you would like to share with our audience where and why you became interested in, in studying Hasidut. Obviously now you have the hat, as you said, 
method of being the researcher. But most people before they research actually fall in love with the thing itself. Uh, so I'm, I'm curious where and when that happened for you. Wow. So it's a very good question. Uh, and I always, uh, I always uh, think about it every time I answer it in a different way. So uh, you said you gave a very nice introduction to this and I, it's currently an ongoing debate. I see it in the publications, the recent publications and recent book reviews that I've read about this idea of the revival of Hasidut learning in the religious Zionist world. And also now in a way in the modern Orthodox world, um, in the States, in, in also. the United States. Yes, yeah, totally. That didn't exist when I was still living there, but I know that it does now. Yeah. yeah. And it's a whole thing. And it's very, it's very debated on, 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 on magazines and newspapers and, and, and so on articles for me is, is different. I, I don't think you said it true. And it, 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 people ask me all the time, are you a Hasid? So I say, first of all, uh, you know, I, I'm, I'm a Sfaradi, I'm a Mizrahi. So <laughs> it's, it, it, it's a different, it's a different qualification. So, um, no, I am not a Hasid in my, in my way of life, but I am a Hasid in a way. Okay. So this is the story. The story is that I was, I was a teenager and I struggled a lot with, with religion. Uh, and I, and I looked for someone to say something very simple and give me life advice. And I found it very much in all kind of uh, self self guidance and self support books. And I said that this is great. Um, but then I remember opening my first Hasidut book, I think it was I think it was something from Chabad. And I saw this idea of bringing the Tanakh to say something that is for me as a teenager in Yerushalayim. And that shocked me because the Tanakh was always a book you learn and you need to aspire to be Moshe Rabbeinu. You need to aspire to be Avraham Avinu and so on and so on. And your achnasat orchim should be this and so on. And then someone says, no, no, no. Like, I know where you are. Let me give you a small step. And then let's see what you do with the small step. And I was intrigued instantly. And I was like, okay, this is, this is something new. And I couldn't stop reading ever since. And I had conversations with people and I said, you know, I, I'm sure when the Rishonim or, or whatever, the commentaries of the Torah, the Midrash even, when it, they wrote the Midrash and when they wrote their commentary on the Torah, they wanted us to have the same sensation. Oh, this is applicable to me tomorrow. I can do something with this. I don't need to be inspired to be, I don't know, David Amelech. I can learn something from the parasha as I read it in Bet Knesset or as I read it in a book on Shabbat or as I read it as I'm commuting to work that would change the way I think tomorrow. And for living in a generation that had this great layer of people that wrote the same thing connecting to our generation is a privilege and we should dive into it. And as I dive into it, I discovered that not all people do this. <laughs> not all Hasidic writers do it. And some Hasidic writers wrote something that I felt that I'm very uncomfortable with and actually brought me back a few steps if I took them seriously. So it, it changed it a lot. But the actual possibility of, of reading the, the Tanakh, right? And again, it's, it's very new because thinking about it, not a lot of people, we have this gap between the Rishonim that writes about Parashat Shavua all the way to write Hasidut, because most people, if you want to be a Tamid Chacham, you would write about the Gemara, mm -hmm. you would write a Chidushim book, right? So where you go to Pasht Shavuah. So reading the Tanakh every Shabbat, every minute, and saying, oh, this is super applicable to me, the next morning was a breakthrough to me. It led me ever since. You know, as, as you're speaking, I'm thinking about the cultural difference of our background, not also that you're from a Svaradi family and I'm from an Ashkenazi family, <laughs> but also... I feel that in where I grew up in the States, you know, going to these classic summer camps and different schools that I went to, that Musar, which is what you were saying you were attracted to, to a certain degree, meaning what, what brought you into Hasidut was the idea that this parasha has something to say to me right now, it's going to impact my behavior tomorrow. That's a discipline of Musar, of, of, a, of, a, of an internal religious discipline. It's funny because that's the language that that people around me always spoke, I meaning without quoting the Shem Mishmuel, mm. but, and, you know, we also spoke with this idea of like the Frum Kite, that concept, which, which you've been sort of observing in a, in a complimentary way in the world you've been immersed in this year in New York, which yeah. is something that is not, you don't see it in the same way necessarily um, in Israel. Again, broad generalizations, don't quote us on anything. These are broad ideas. Yes. We're happy to speak more about, send me an email. <laughs> but, but the point being that 
It's interesting that you say that because I feel like for so many years I was fed a lot of Musar and like, here's your go learn tomorrow. You're going to work on this in your Avodat Hashem. And it's funny because my growth curve was to do something different. I Meaning my growth curve was to, you know, go more towards the text or see broader historical phenomenon. And it's interesting. It's interesting just different people's movement within the things they're exposed to, the kind of language that, that they receive and the language that they need at, at that moment. You know, I sort of over time need to the language that was going to both deepen things internally, but also like broaden the perspective on the text I was seeing. So now as a researcher, of course, you're seeing a very broad perspective uh, on the Hasidic text. But thanks for answering that. I always almost most interested in in how people are drawn to the things they do. So I appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you. I hope you've enjoyed this conversation as much as I did. I'm Dr. Yosefa Fogel Rubel, and this is One on One Women Talk Torah, a series brought to you by Matan Women's Institute for Torah Study. Please do One on One and Women's Torah Learning a small favor by sharing this podcast with family and friends so that we can reach new listeners. You can stream and download these episodes on Spotify, iTunes, Google Podcasts, SoundCloud, and Matan's website. Don't forget to leave us a five star review in the comments. Please send us any feedback at podcast at matan.org.il. That's podcast at matan.org.il. Thanks for listening, everyone.